I'm very happy to be visiting again Mobile. The last time I think it was 10 years ago. I was here twice before. So this is my third time. And already it's been a joy before the meeting started to have met so many of the students that have gone through the Kingdom Ministry School and some of the Gilead School and to have met them again and to see your families and perhaps after this program is over with I'll be able to see uh, many more of you and uh, I've been surprised to see some even from New Orleans and other faraway places. This morning we'd like to make a study uh, what are your expectations during Earth's present hour of test. This morning at 8 o'clock, the religious editor of the local newspaper came to the hotel where I was staying and we had a half hour session interview and uh, she brought with her the uh, Times Magazine article that appeared uh, a week ago, February 13th, headed growth arrested and so she wanted to know details about why it is that Jehovah's Witnesses uh, had uh, a three percent decrease which of course this article featured and made a big point about so I mentioned that uh, today Jehovah's Witnesses are the largest Christian missionary organization on earth and that's true we're found in 216 lands of the earth and that uh, last year there were 2,225,000 active preachers in the field and that's a tremendous uh, working force and that there isn't another organization anywhere near that has a group of active ones letting their light shine out in the field, in the service. As Jesus said, you're the light of the world. And I said it's true that we had a slight dip, but uh, that was, uh, there are factors that uh, come into the picture, but there was no dip as far as the attendance at our meetings were concerned. I showed her that uh, for the last year, we had the largest attendance of memorial that uh, we've ever had, over 5 million, giving, in, uh, giving indication of increased uh, uh, growth and being in touch. And that uh, there were more than 127,000 baptized, which is evidence of great growth, too, or, or evidence of fruitage. And uh, I said that... Uh, also, there's been an increase in the number of countries where the work is banned. Last year, Argentina, Bandas, uh, Congo. So there are now 46 countries where we're banned, and this has uh, brought about a slight decrease that way. But on the other hand, we I mentioned also that uh, uh, we're all voluntary workers and that in view of the increased pressures of living and inflation, that even our people too, as voluntary workers, uh, some of them have not been able to put as much time in the preaching service as uh, perhaps last year. But still, there's a tremendous work going on. And we're glad to see that even here in the Mobile area, we've had a new congregation three new kingdom halls in the last couple of years. These are all evidences of continued growth. And we feel sure that after the 1978 assemblies this summer, which uh, will be phenomenal, and uh, uh, no doubt every one of you here will be in New Orleans uh, for one of those two assemblies there. It's a must. We need it for our spiritual strength and encouragement that uh, we will move still further ahead. So, what are your expectations? Well, man is a creature of expectations. Uh, some people's expectations are based on dreams which never materialize. Uh, 
some, of course, uh, all of us have expectations when it comes to work, money that we earn, farmers as far as their fields are concerned, and agreements that are signed, tokens, down payments are made, and certain material expectations uh, are uh, hoped for and uh, realized. But uh, there are other expectations that we're talking about. We're talking about great expectations, uh, godly expectations, expectations based uh, on God's Word, the Bible, precious promises. And uh, these uh, expectations are what we call assured expectations assured expectations of things hoped for. Does anyone here in the front uh, help me out? What is, uh, what is that a definition of? Assured expectations hoped for. Right over here, sister. Faith, yes. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is assured expectation of things hoped for. Uh, evident demonstrations of things not beheld. So we're dealing with uh, that type of expectations that are sure with great uh, uh, promises by the living God. And uh, these are great expectations. And we as Jehovah's Witnesses have great expectations. Now, we're going to spell these out in detail, but of course, uh, the greatest expectation is to have life, survival through this great world crisis, and to eventually receive the marvelous prize of, ever prize of everlasting life. Those are indeed tremendous, greatest expectations that are set before us. Now, 1975, was mentioned many times in the society's publications over the years before 1975. And uh, in uh, these uh, most cases, it was mentioned that 1975 was uh, the chronological end of 6,000 years of human history. And that has been true. And uh, 6,000 years uh, came to an end as far as man being on the earth in September 1975, and the society still holds to that. There have been re-examinations again of this chronology, and it's absolutely true. And we are now moving into a period beyond 1975. Now, from the years 1966 to 1975, there were published uh, nine uh, small statements of prospects of what might happen 1975 and immediately thereafter. Now, uh, those prospects, as stated, uh, that Armageddon would be coming, the Great Tribulation would begin, uh, the Millennial Reign uh, would begin in soon thereafter. Well, uh, those uh, prospects we now see were premature, did not happen. And uh, it is regretted that those nine statements were published uh, in the minor way as they were over those nine years prior to 1975. But uh, the major number of times in 1975 was presented in our publication that it was always uh, that it was the ending of the 6,000 years of human history which has proved to be true. So then uh, were these prospects speculations? Hardly. Now speculations, uh, as speculators in the world, you're gamblers, you're taking a chance. When it's a speculation, why it could come true, or it could never come true. 
Now, these prospects of uh, the Great Tribulation, the destruction of Babylon the Great, uh, Armageddon, the destruction of the nations, and the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ are still true. There's nothing false about those. They're going to come. They're part of the assured expectations. They're all backed up by biblical guarantees, precious promises of the living God. So while there may have been a prematureness there, yet there was no speculation. Those are prospects uh, somewhat maybe thought to be delayed, but truly to come. Hebrews 2.3 says, even if it should delay, in, uh, from our human viewpoint, even if it should delay, keep in expectation, because we're dealing with the highest and the greatest of expectations. For it will without fail come true. It will not be late. It will not be late according to God's timetable. And after all, it's not the vindication of our name that's involved in the progression of things. It's the vindication of God's name. So this situation is something like uh, I explained to the king of Agboa when my family and myself were in um, Nigeria in 1974. The uh, local elders arranged for me to have an interview with the king, and so we were ushered into his uh, uh, big home. Uh, he was already dressed in his regal garments. He had his uh, scepter in his hand. He spoke perfect English, having been trained in England. He must have been a man about uh, 50, very uh, gracious, friendly, and so he sat us down and he permitted us to make a recording of the interview. So I and the brother, Brother Ajayi, the elder who went along with us, didn't tell me that he already had uh, a series of four studies in the truth book with the king. So the king was familiar with our work. Well, anyway, I went forward with my little Bible presentation and uh, he was patient and he thought, listened through and, and participated. Then he finally said, I, uh, what puzzles me is why it is that my people here in my uh, area who are Jehovah's Witnesses say that Armageddon is going to come in 1975. That's next year. When uh, didn't Jesus say that the day and the hour knows no man? And so I had to commend the king. Yes, and that's a very good question. And so I endeavored at that time to reason with him that uh, it's like uh, a great physical storm, a hurricane that like you have down south here, the skies get terrifically black, and uh, the weather forecasters will say maybe the storm's going to hit Mobile at 3 o'clock, or in his case, uh, Agboa at 3 o'clock. But no, uh, 3 o'clock comes, and the storm didn't break. Now, are you going to call those weathermen false prophets? Hardly. They were, they were a little premature in their timing and estimate. But you see the clouds are still getting more threatening. And the storm breaks at 5 o'clock. But the storm comes. And so the same thing is here. Some Jehovah's Witnesses have thought that the storm is going to break in 1975. And we'll have to wait and see whether it does or whether it uh, comes a little later. But in any case, it's up to the Most High God to determine this. And I asked him, I said, 
Are there storm clouds on the international scene today? And that was 1974, and he said, yes, there are. And I said, are they getting darker? He said, they certainly are. So he was satisfied with that answer. And of course, as we know, it's turning out that way. We still do not know the day and the hour, but the clouds are getting darker. And uh, Earth's hour of test is here. So now let's pause for a few minutes and check on this uh, uh, present hour of test, because our lecture, our study is, what are your expectations during Earth's present hour of test? Well, the hour of test is mentioned in Revelation 3.10. So let's all take a look at that and get the build up there because we're right in that time now. Uh, Revelation 3, uh, verse 7, Jesus is speaking here to the congregation of Philadelphia, which was a congregation of faithful ones back there in the first century, and uh, picture the faithful anointed today, uh, along with the uh, great crowd who are also faithful and active, and uh, these are the things that he says, who is holy, that's Jesus Christ, who is true, who has the key of David, he has the key that unlocks the way to the household of Jehovah, the 144,000. No one can get into that 144,000 except through Jesus Christ who has the key. And we will be celebrating the memorial uh, soon on March the 23rd. But remember, it's Jesus that has the key to the 144,000 who opens so that no one will shut and shut so that no one opens, so no one else uh, uh, governs this matter. I know your deeds. He knows our deeds today of faithfulness. I set before you an open door. That's the ministry. We've been preaching now for years, and it's still open. It's uh, The devil is trying to shut it in these 46 countries where the work is done, but the brothers keep going as best they can. And that you have little power, we have little power and influence as far as the political governments of the earth are concerned, but that's not the big thing. And uh, you kept my word and did not prove false to my name, so we've been faithful witnesses year after year, 1975, 1976, 1977, now 1978. And uh, look, I will good those uh, from the synagogue of Satan. So this is the congregation of uh, the hypocritical uh, religionists of Christendom, together with their clergy, who say they are Jews, they claim to be spiritual Jews in the New Covenant, and yet they are not, but are lying. So most of so-called Christendom are in a lying position. They're not the true servants of God. Look, I will make them come and do obeisance before your feet and make you know I have loved you. So even now, many clergy say they wish the members of their congregation had the zeal of Jehovah's Witnesses. You've heard that many times yourself, have you not? So they begin to recognize that we are doing a tremendous work. And uh, look at the power of uh, transforming the lies, the truth has had over the people. This is something in Russia alone, for instance, uh, that's a tremendous witness. They have um, the power of alcoholism in Russia. They're drinking too much vodka. And the government is trying to overcome alcoholism. They have a campaign constantly, and, and it's not successful. But here they see there are Jehovah's Witnesses in these various villages who are becoming, these people who are becoming Jehovah's Witnesses, and they're able to this matter of alcoholism. And it's a tremendous witness. And so they're giving a witness there too, as we are in many ways. And uh, uh, in 1950, when the New World Translation came out with the name Jehovah, uh, taken from the Greek scriptures of the Septuagint, uh, where it had been left in the complete uh, Hebrew tetragrammaton form, the clergy laughed at us in 1950. But now in 1977, in March, in the journal of biblical literature, the uh, classic uh, journal that reaches all clergy of Christendom, had an article there by Professor Howard from a Southern University here, 
who's made a complete study of a divine name in the Greek scriptures. And he says that Jehovah's Witnesses were right and that other manuscripts have been now found besides the Fuad papyri that shows the Tetragrammaton there in the Greek. And so there again you see the clergy are beginning to have to bow and to recognize that we have been led and guided in the right way. And then uh, in the October issue of the uh, Scientific American, the uh, Claudius Ptolemy, his canon uh, of the um, uh, Babylonish rulers, which gives a shortened version, and uh, he claimed to be an astronomer of his time. And so the Seventh-day Adventists and the others have been relying upon his uh, uh, figures rather than the internal chronology of the Bible. And for that reason, even the Jews have used his canon to show that Jerusalem fell in 586 rather than in 607 B.C. as Jehovah's Witnesses have maintained from internal Bible chronology. And so now this canon which uh, the clergy have relied on has now proved to be false. So now what they're going to do to try to bolster their chronology, we'll have to wait and see. But they've always been 20 years off from Jehovah's Witnesses, and we've maintained the, the Bible uh, consistency. So here again, there's a recognition that the consistent stand that we've taken is being supported. So now we come to this hour of test, verse 10. Because you kept the word about my endurance, Jesus Christ was faithful during his ministry, I will also keep you from the hour of test. Here we are, Jehovah's people, and many new ones who are here too. And, and most all of us here are dedicated, baptized, and if we prove faithful, and uh, keep building up the great expectations that uh, are set before us. He is going to keep us from this hour of test. That means we're going to be protected during this hour of test. Because notice what Jesus goes on to say, which is to come upon the whole inhabited earth, to put a test upon those dwelling on the earth. That test has been upon mankind now since 1919. According to Revelation 12, 12, when was Satan cast out of heaven? Anyone here near the front where I can see? Uh, what is the time we generally understand that to be? Uh, all right, here in the second row, thank you. Well, in 1914 is when the uh, war in heaven began, but certainly by 1919 he was cast out of heaven and the great troubles began as far as uh, mankind is concerned. So, the hour of test now, Satan has been cast out because he knows his time is but short, is very short. And the word hour in the Bible, in the Greek, means a short time. So we're in this short time, and Satan knows he's got to foment uh, mankind, keep it in a turbulent position and uh, under great pressures, and the pressures are increasing, and we're in that time of great test, and these pressures have come upon all mankind, even including Jehovah's Witnesses. And we must admit that the pressures today in 1978 are far higher than they were in 1975, and they're going to get greater uh, next year. So this hour of test is here. Now if our faith is strong, we're going to be able to get through. But most of mankind will not get through. Now uh, this hour of test, uh, this short time, uh, is also indicated uh, how um, in Revelation 17, uh, 12, uh, the ten horns that you saw mean ten kings who must have, uh, who have not yet received a kingdom, but they do receive authority as kings one hour uh, with the wild beast. So uh, when does this eighth king with uh, this eighth world power, which is with its ten kings, which is also given one hour, 
Uh, when that, did that begin to come on the scene? What was the first form of this eighth king? Does anyone remember? Uh, all right, the brother there. The brother says the League of Nations. Yes, and the League of Nations was proposed in the Versailles Treaty of 1919 and then became a ruling fact on January 1920. But notice that uh, this whole arrangement is going to be given just one hour. And we're in that period now, are we not, since 1919. So we have these proofs here that uh, this hour of great test is now. From 1919 onward, and all the facts supported, Matthew 24, Luke 21, uh, Mark 13, uh, taking us right up to the time when the um, uh, hour strikes for the great tribulation. So we are in this hour of test. In addition to these pressures, uh, pressures from uh, every human source, and Satan is using every device he can, he's out to morally destroy our youth through emphasis on sex, uh, pornographic literature, uh, permissiveness, and even the older ones. So all this is putting on a great moral test upon mankind and even upon Jehovah's Witnesses. Satan is out to destroy not only the anointed and disturb them if he can, but now it's the great crowd. To his great chagrin, there are more than two million that have now come out and taken their active stand. And so he's got to do what he can to uh, uh, destroy the great crowd. He doesn't want a single one thing with this great tribulation. He knows he's not going to get through. He's going to drag down the whole present system of things over his head, and he wants to drag us down with him. So the invisible demons, uh, with all their sly cunning uh, and uh, devices, are being employed to get us, to trap us, and uh, these uh, are terrific in their design and pressure. And then he's using materialism, the glitter of wealth and riches, and uh, the idea of, well, leaving the truth for a little while and having a fling with the world and then coming back, repent, and you'll be able to have your same standing. But all that's false reasoning. Every time you make a misstep, wrongdoing, serious, you're causing a scar, and this can uh, greatly disturb you and hurt you, and, uh, and you may not make it through the great tribulation. So we've got to put up a great fight here. Uh, rebelliousness uh, is on the increase as far as the old order society is concerned, but even amongst now the devil is trying to put across the idea upon some, well, you just don't have to be as faithful as you used to. Uh, go into the field of pleasure now, and uh, maybe only one or two hours a month in the service, and uh, uh, getting so involved with other things. And then there are nationalistic uh, uh, things, nationalism, uh, creature worship, sports heroes, TV heroes. The TV itself is becoming a terrific instrument in the hands of the devil to put pressure upon all mankind and of course to try to suck under in this whirlpool uh, the great crowd if he can, or as many of them as he can, or our youth if he can and then some of the anointed ones, if possible. So we're in this uh, growing whirlpool of pressures uh, that the devil and the demons, and in this way, too, they're trying to put a mark of the beast on the forehead, on the thinking uh, of individuals. And sad to say, in a few cases, some uh, of uh, our associates a year or two back have uh, given in and uh, already gotten this mark of the beast. Their thinking is worldly, materialistic, and uh, even very immoral. And uh, they had to be disfellowshipped and uh, been sent away. And some of them think, well, they can maybe repent and come back. But as I said before, there's a scar. 
and uh, you can't remove a scar, the scar stays there, and uh, handicaps one. We know also that Haggai 2.6 says that Jesus Christ and Jehovah God are going to rock the nations. And we're in that rocking time now. But in this rocking of the nations, in this hour of test, he's rocking out the precious things. Now what are the precious things that are still being rocked out or shaken out? Anyone in the front here? Uh, uh, who are those precious things that are still being shaken out? Uh, anyone near the front here? Uh, yes? All right, uh, still Jehovah's people are those that become part of the great crowd. Last year there were 127,000 baptized. Aren't those precious things that have been shaken out? Yes. So these, they're the uh, precious ones are still shaken out. So there we are. We're in a time of inspection. And as Peter says, the first ones to be inspected will be the house of God, the anointed. And then they've, they've been going through a testing period way back in 19, 18, 19, 19. But now there seems to be a testing time, uh, a shaking time for those of the great crowd. Are they going to stick it out? Are they going to be able to endure this uh, hour of test? that has come upon all mankind. And notice in verse 11, Jesus goes on to say, I am coming quickly. He's coming quickly as the executioner. And he wrote that way back in the year 96, when the book of Revelation was given to John. But uh, he was showing urgency. And as you know, the whole book of Revelation anyway, applies from 1914 onward. And so uh, his warning now is he's coming quickly as the executioner to begin the great tribulation. So we must have a right attitude, a right viewpoint, and therefore during this period of time that open door, but uh, some are going out of that open door, going the wrong way, they're going out and stepping out into the world. Whereas we're going through the open door in the ministry, and we're glad to see so many of the uh, brothers here still faithful in the pioneer work, auxiliary pioneer work, special pioneer work, and the brothers who uh, have families in the regular field service are doing what they can and are out there in the service. That's the way it should be. And we try to increase our preaching work. And so uh, we're using this open door. But even though a few do go out of the door the other way, that should not disturb us. We must be found faithful to Jehovah God and Jesus Christ, our head. Well, now we come to this matter of expectations, its development. Uh, uh, what are the expectations more in detail? Now, of course, we're all wanting everlasting life. Yes, that's the major goal. But uh, Jehovah God has given us precious promises that involve many wonderful things before then that will enable us to be led to that uh, point of uh, getting the final prize of everlasting life. Let's turn to Acts 3.21. The Apostle Peter referred this as he talked to the Jews. Verse 20 gives us part of the setting and referring to Jehovah. Uh, 19, repent therefore and turn around so as to get your sins blotted out. Well, we've already done that uh, in our Christian times by becoming dedicated and baptized. Uh, that season of refreshing may come from the person of Jehovah. We've been enjoying many seasons of refreshment already. And much spiritual food. There is another group of uh, people on the earth today that has received the abundance of spiritual food progressively as we have. And this has greatly refreshed us. And that you may, and that he may send forth the Christ, the Messiah, appointed for you, Jesus. Now Jesus came back there 1900 years ago but uh, the major presence and coming of Jesus Christ referred to the last days. 
whom heaven indeed must hold within itself until the times of restoration of all things. Now there is part of our great expectations, the times of restoration. In Brother Russell's time, we used to use the King James expression, times of restitution. And then notice times of restoration of all things. And we've got to find out what's included in all that. Of which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets of old time. So there are many prophecies that spell out in detail these expectations. So this uh, then brings us now to Ephesians 1, 8, where we're going to spell out uh, about the restoration of all things. We'll start with verse 8 to get the build up here, the setting. Uh, this uh, he caused to abound. God did, is that God is the subject here. Verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jehovah God is the subject here. Uh, verse 9, In that he, Jehovah God, made known to us, that would be the spiritual ones of the first century, uh, the sacred secret of his will, now the sacred secret of his will uh, refers to the, his will to restore all things and to bring about a universal um, peace and to bring, to bring about a reunion. So uh, he's referring there to his purpose to bring about a restoration of all things. It is according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. So Jehovah God, being the marvelous God of love, has purposed something tremendous uh, for all of us. And that's part of great expectations that we have. And these are assured, and that helps us to have strong faith we need faith today to endure this hour of earth's test. Most people today are losing faith in God. Well, for an administration, verse 10. The word administration from the Greek uh, more literally means household management. So Jehovah God is the grand creator is the great of the whole universe. And so being a household manager, he's arranged a household management of things. So he has worked out the complete program of restoration. And that is called for an administration in the uh, at the full limit. Now, we used to think that that administration was limited to just the kingdom, which was established in 1914, and it's beginning to interrupt and interfere with Earth's affairs. But we now see that this household management of Jehovah even began earlier. Now, notice, uh, for an administration, household management, and it's God's household, the heavens and the earth, uh, at the full limit of the appointed times, namely, to gather all things together, things, the restoration of all things. And now we come to the key word, which many of us for many years uh, overlooked until the man's salvation book came to our attention. And that's the little word again. Put a circle around that, because that's definitely in the Greek. 
Uh, the preposition is ana, A-N-A. -A. You look that up in your interlinear. You see ana again. Now, most Bible translators have ignored the uh, ana, but not so uh, Rotherham and some other uh, careful translators. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Rotherham says reunited. So if something's going to be reunited, it must have been united once before. And uh, the New World Translation, if it's going to bring all things together again, it means that things must have been gathered together again once before. Because here it's got to be repeated. So, according to our newer understanding, the last uh, 75, What's again throwing us back to? Back to the days of Israel? Is it throwing us back to the days of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had marvelous promises made to them? Well, our new understanding is, the again throws us way back to Edenic times. And so, in the Garden of Eden, was there a unification between Jehovah in the heavens and Adam and Eve on the earth? Yes, for a short time. We still don't know how long that time was. Let's just take a look at that, uh, Genesis, the second chapter. Because all our hopes for the future depend upon the restoration again to what existed originally as God designed it and prepared it. Well now Genesis 2-7, we're all familiar with that scripture, how uh, he proceeded to form man out of the dust of the ground. And in verse 8, he planted a garden in Eden toward the east, so Eden must have been a very large land area, but only the eastern part uh, was developed into a beautiful paradise. And like the eight book shows, uh, it must have been located uh, about 180 miles uh, west of Lake Van, which is the area where um, uh, Noah and the ark landed on Mount Ararat. And since uh, the ark is a chest, it didn't move too far, and so it must have landed uh, within uh, 100 or 200 miles of the original uh, place where, uh, where Noah lived. And Noah may have lived uh, uh, somewhat outside the Garden of Eden, which would throw the garden again a little further west. Anyway, you check up the aid book on that, which gives us our latest view as to about where the Garden of Eden was located. In a way, uh, this garden was prepared. Jehovah God made to grow out of uh, the ground every tree desirable to uh, one site. So it was a beautiful botanical garden too, something like the beautiful gardens that you have here in uh, Mobile that I visited the last time I was here 10 years ago. And uh, then there was this tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. And as we know, that uh, these uh, were literal trees but with uh, uh, symbolic significance. And uh, there were four rivers issuing out. We won't go into all that. Then let's skip on down to verse 15. And Jehovah God proceeded to take the man and settle him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to take care of it. So man was given assignment in this very beautiful place. He had work to perform. So uh, in this literal paradise, it was more than a zoo. If Jehovah was only interested in the zoo, a perfect paradise with perfect animals and man being just uh, 
part of the solical creation, why uh, that might be uh, interesting, but Jehovah God uh, is far more interested than just having a zoo here on the earth. So uh, Jehovah God created Adam and Eve in the image of God. And since God uh, is the God of wisdom, justice, love, and power, and uh, man was created with those similar attributes, the animals don't have those. But in addition, our God lives on and on and on. And so he